Hello, everybody. Hi, uh, I'm Ben Harrison. Uh, I am with the Amplify team. And today, I am actually going to talk to all of you about a social and collaborative classroom. So to do that, I have a little bit of a presentation I'm going to run through. Uh, give me a second to pull that up. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I will either answer them towards the end of our time today, or follow up with all of that. Oh, there's the there's a feedback piece. Um, I'll make sure that I have make time to follow up with all of that uh, before we're done here. Okay, so for the next 30 minutes, my goal today is to make sure that we talk about a, a social and collaborative math class. We're really doing a deep dive for educators into unpacking this and creating something that, that's going to feel and look a little bit different for everyone. Um, not just feel and look different because everybody has a different way of teaching, but the world in which we're teaching today is, is different than what it was 6, 12, 18 months ago. So when we talk about this, uh, as we unpack it a little bit uh, for the next 30, what I want you to think about is what can I take from what Ben is saying and really inspire and change some of the things that I'm doing in my classroom as we move forward, okay? So first, let, let's get to the heart of it, right? Who, who's this Ben guy and, and why is he on my screen? So. I'm Ben, uh, Ben Harrison. I'm with the Amplify STEM team and I'm one of the A Amplify STEM experts. What that means is I work with teachers and school districts and even product developers and, and product owners to help create the best ed tech math experience that's out there. Um, I also do a little bit with science, but math is really my passion because as you can see from this, from this brief CV, uh, I was a math teacher for a very long time. When you see me on the street, uh, you, you, all this stuff doesn't necessarily come to fruition into your head and you say, hey, you know what? I can put all this together for Ben. But for the last 20 years, what I've really been doing is trying to change education and make it a better place. And how I got my start in all of that really was in a social and collaborative math classroom. So let's take it back a couple of steps. <sighs> When I first started understanding that I was good at math and clearly not good at 80s clothing choices, um, I, I, was in, I was in upper elementary school. Um, what I found is I was a kid that the only time I would raise my hand or the only time that I would ask the teacher to call on me was in math class because math is where I had confidence. Math is where I felt comfortable and math spoke to me. For whatever reason, I, w I was a math kid, right? What I'm, when I look back on it, when I reflect on how that math class was, is it's just the opposite of what we're talking about today. There, there was no social collaborative effort. The only time I actually found myself talking to a peer was when the teacher put me out in the hall to work with someone else because they weren't getting a concept that I understood. And I think a lot of us that are kind of math people went through that. Um, as I was building this presentation, I also stumbled across this picture because it came to me that I didn't learn math all on my own. I actually learned it from a teacher and that teacher was my grandmother. Um, she was a teacher in Northeastern Ohio in the early, in the 1950s and 60s. And when she would come over and watch us, especially when I was younger, or she would come over and spend time with us as I got a little bit older, we would play card games. Right? She was teaching me numbers through gamification way before those terms were ever a thing. And she was teaching me to have confidence in math, and I had it. I was what I'd like to call a, a shining math star at one point. But again, like all things, uh, life hits us, things change, and, and, and we evolve. Um, or in this particular case, my outfit choices pretty much stayed the same. I'm, I'm the kid in the middle here. Um, but I didn't evolve. Uh, I think I devolved a, as I grew older. In fact, um, after we lost our, my grandmother and my family moved to Arizona, um, my math shining star somehow got hidden in the back of a closet. I, I have no idea. I, I think throughout middle school and early high school, my focus was really on just survival more than it was on showing the, all the math skills that I had. Um, the story that I like to tell here is about my freshman year of high school. Um, I was in Algebra 1, uh, traditional math class. I wasn't, I wasn't a shining bright student. In fact, um, the only lesson that I remember learning in Algebra 1 that year, and by the way, uh, pro tip, 
it also applies for your career um, is never answer the question, do you think I fell off a turnip truck yesterday, right? Um, I was, a teacher posed that question to me, my, my elder one teacher posed that question to me. And it turns out that that was a great indicator that I was actually gonna fail algebra one. And that summer, when I went to meet with my guidance counselor and talk about my choices, uh, my career path, and as I sat and watched him and listened to him, put me on a path to nowhere in, in my academic career, um, an angel stepped into the office. Uh, that angel, his name was Dr. Mann, and honestly, he saved my life. And, and he did it with a social and collaborative math classroom. Dr. Mann put his head in that, in that office. He said, excuse me, Mr. Rodriguez. He said, young man, uh, I teach math, and I would be happy to have you in my class. Uh, are you going to give it 100%? Because if your answer is going to be yes, then I'm going to sign your waiver, and you're going to be in my class next week. I said, yes, sir. I'm going to give it 100%. And a week later, I walked into the very first social classroom I had ever seen or even ever heard about. There were no desks. There were no rows and columns. There were tables with chairs all around it. Just, just the whole physical nature of the classroom was different. Um, we sat down. He introduced himself as Dr. Mann, and he told us the following three things to make sure that we were prepared to succeed in his class. He said, first, if you're not comfortable in your seat where you are right now, get up and find some place that's going to be comfortable because in this room, we are going to be working together and we're going to do it often. He said, second, in the real world, there are math problems and they use real world skills and technologies to solve them. So we're going to use TI-81s at the time, but graphing calculators to start solving these math problems. And then third, he said, my job is to make you good at math, or, or at least make you understand math. Your job is to do it. So I need everyone here to be able to do the absolute best they can at all times. And if that's something that you can do, stay. If you can't, there's a door. Sign up for a new class and no hard feelings. As it turns out, uh, as, as I progressed through my, my math career, not only did I stay in his class, I stayed in his class for the next two years. And over the next two years, what I discovered was my math shining star just needed to be dusted off a little bit. Uh, I, I was ready to learn. And, and I even graduated high school. After failing algebra one, I graduated high school with not only A's in math for the rest of it, but college credit for my calculus courses that I took my senior year. I needed somebody to believe in me and I needed somebody to give me an environment where I could become the person I wanted to be. And Dr. Mann did exactly that in his social and collaborative classroom. So when I graduated ASU, um, I had a choice and I said, what is it I want to become when I'm older? And I graduated with a degree in teaching because much like a lot of the teachers in this audience, a lot of the educators that are here, I want to make a difference in somebody's life. I want to make a difference in at least one kid's life as they go forward. And I wanted to recreate that exact same social and collaborative classroom that he gave me. Um, I didn't want any kid to be on a road to nowhere simply because of the choices that one teacher made at some point. I want them to be on the road somewhere because of the choices another teacher made. So let's make sure that you're in the right place because math teachers chuckle at jokes like this. Um, and, and as you can tell, I'm a math teacher, so I have a bad math teacher joke uh, in every presentation. This is the one. Um, and just to, just to kind of loosen the mood a little bit, uh, I thought I'd share it with you today. If you haven't used it, take it, use it with your classroom. Really for the rest of this 30, um, how I'm talking about a social and collaborative classroom really contains three, these three components, right? We gotta talk about math. And when I talk about becoming and creating math experts, I don't mean the kids in your room. I mean you, okay? I mean the educators that are interacting with kids. When I talk about social, uh, I don't mean just talking to each other, but I, I mean engaging in what we call mathematical discourse and understanding what social emotional learning is. And when we talk about coll collaborative, I don't mean just people in the same space, kind of chatting and kind of understanding. I, I mean, true group work and true cooperative learning. And I do, I mean all of those things because these are what, as educators, we can control. 
all of the other stuff. I, I think over the last six months, we've discovered that there's a variety of things outside of our control um, that, that people are just gonna push on us. But these three things are all within us. So let's unpack them a little bit. In a picture, I want you to think about your classroom this way. I want you to think about kids uh, sitting around talking to each other, but actively engaged in a cooperative math discourse, actively working towards solving a problem. Uh, some people work better with pictures. Uh, when we were building our house, um, I had no idea what any of the rooms looked like. Uh, I had to have the architectural drawings and somebody to, to arriving with a picture. But more importantly than all of these things, when you engage in group work, when you have a positive and impactful social and collaborative math classroom, right? the kids are growing. They might not be growing the exact same way that, that you pictured it, but they're growing in different ways. Speaking of distance learning, quick little 30 second commercial. Uh, I had a teacher come to me in April of this year and they said, hey Ben, uh, I know you talk about this social and collaborative classroom, but now we're remote learning and I host a couple of Zoom sessions every week. It's rare that kids show up, but more importantly, I don't know who's gonna show up or how to get them to do group work when I just have one Zoom session. And I posed the question back to them. I said, well, how do you do group work in your class? And they said, we put the desks together, we put them in groups, I give them an activity, and I have them all start tearing it apart and trying to solve it. And I said, but I think we can do the exact same things digitally. Instead of thinking about it as one Zoom or Google Meet session, why don't you host four or five concurrently? And then as a teacher, just like you do in your classroom, Make your way around from session to session instead of just focusing on one, just like you do uh, with the groups, with the little pods around your classroom. That was a revolution to this particular teacher. They, they were absolutely amazed. They said, wait, I can host multiple, multiple sessions? I said, yes, but the only thing you wanna make sure is keep a sheet so that you know which group is in which session at what time. Otherwise, you're just gonna find yourself revisiting the same one over and over again. So what we have given our environment is a number of challenges in front of us, but also a number of great opportunities to reinvent the way that we've always done education, okay? So keep that in mind as I start dissecting those three parts. And let's start with the math piece, okay? I stole this from Zero Dark Thirty, uh, feel free to use it. But when I talk about understanding mathematics, what I mean is have a math trade craft. That means, you be the prevailing expert in all things mathematics in your classroom. That doesn't mean that you have to show kids up and, and always be right. I, I think sometimes as, as educators, or even sometimes it's just as adults, right? We always have to be right in some cases, but that's not the case. Uh, a true math educator is going to lead kids towards the right path and let them start to discover it, okay? How you develop your math trade craft is exactly through sessions like this. Visiting professional development. Uh, NCTM had 100 days of professional development this summer, and it's still going on. The STEM Leadership Alliance is a great place. There's dozens and dozens of resources, but organizations put out a tremendous amount of information for you to consume, but you gotta make time for it. Uh, and me as an educator, um, I relied on this middle box far too much. And now, hopefully, I'm part of that solution instead of part of that problem. When I was a math teacher, I think all I did was read the, the teacher's edition and I would read the teacher's notes and I would practice the different examples that they gave us. That's not diving deep into math. That's, that's scratching the surface as a math educator. Publishers are getting better, right? Um, myself with Amplify, uh, I know that we're changing the way that we do things. We bring the math minds to the table as we're developing it and host professional development sessions with them. Um, the other publishers in the business are doing the same as well. I've seen some of them uh, also on the STEM Leadership Alliance virtual session. So keep your eyes out for them and, and really grow your toolbox, okay? Last but not least is social media or, or what I like to call my math dessert or stuff I would have on Pi Day. Okay, truthfully, absolutely last bad math joke of, of the day. Um, Sunil is a great example. Uh, Sunil posts math knowledge and math history, and math history um, because he's truly a math historian that I've never heard of and never understood before. I, and I appreciate it. 
and allows me to, uh, in 144 characters or less, really dive in to something and then go research it if I want to do it more. But what I'm saying is make math knowledge your trade craft. Be the expert in the room. It doesn't mean that you always have to just talk about it. And let's not forget about math instruction as well. Uh, when we look at Peg and we look at Joe, um, these are two of the leaders in the world of instruction that also show it through what we call a mathematical lens, right? Um, both of these ladies are tremendous and Joe out of Stanford and Peg with her orchestrating five practices really will show you what great instruction looks like through that math lens with examples in their textbooks. And for those of you that are not, hey, uh, I wanna read, because some of us that grew up being comfortable with math are, aren't really big into reading. I know I'm not huge into reading. I would much rather watch something. Both of them have lots of YouTube out there. Uh, you can watch them, watch their math instruction and really refine your math trade craft as well. Second commercial break is my social justice moment. And, and this is for those teachers that are out there that really like to include math history in their conversation. So quick social justice moment. If you're gonna include Galileo, if you're gonna include Newton in your conversation, please also make sure that you're including Annie Easley and Katherine Johnson and Sophia Germain, right? Um, these are all mathematicians. We can't start to exclude everyone. And I say this because as we focus on just some of those that are way in the past or some that what we call the, the white wigs, um, we neglect the future mathematicians and then the more recent mathematicians that have really changed the world closer to what we know it. So quick social justice moment, let's include everybody, okay? So once we get math under our belt uh, and we start building that, remember it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. It's, it's going to be something that's gonna be continually developed over time. Um, the next piece is to start looking at collaborative. And I think we've all done group work before. And I, I think when we start looking at cooperative learning, um, we know some of the pitfalls that are there, right? Uh, the image on the left is reality. Uh, the words on the right of your screen are some of the more articulate ways of talking about the challenges in group work, but this is really what we know. Um, just putting kids in a room, giving them an assignment, and then hoping that they get it done isn't an instructional practice, really isn't an instructional strategy. What it is, is it's a hope and a prayer, right? Because hopefully at least one of those kids will get it done and then everybody else will listen. And then maybe some knowledge will be there. That's not what effective collaboration is. And I, I'm saying this as somebody who's practiced ineffective collaboration in his math class for years. Um, one of the terms my son started using in his Fortnite world is nerd. And, and I wanna tell you that I've adapted it. I've become socially relevant. I've adapted it for this presentation so that you can think about it as well. And when I talk about nerd, when I'm talking about our norms, roles, responsibilities, and then D. The reason the D is in red is because it is difficult, but the D stands for dependencies, okay? By all of that, what I mean is groups need to have a reason to work together and need to have a pathway to work together. They're only gonna get that if a teacher designs it that way, right? Just like water, for, for my science teachers that are out there, we all know that water takes the path of least resistance. Students learning, are gonna do exactly the same. Um, the image on the right uh, was one I found online and this combines roles and responsibilities. And this is a great example of what could be done in a classroom to make sure that the collaboration that kids are having, the, the work that they're doing together actually is impactful. And, and honestly, it, it gets them learning. Now, there are people out there that say, hey, look, I've been doing direct instruction or, or I do my lecture, my kids do the work, they get it and I've seen scores go up. And you're right, you're hundred percent right. That does have a place for me. I really believe that it has a very small place throughout the 180 days that education takes place throughout the year. But the data proves a little bit better uh, when we talk about group work, in fact, um, most of the research that's ever been done around group work 
came about a decade after I was already in a social and collaborative class. And most of the research that, that's out there or, or published out there is really done by Johnson and Johnson or Johnson, Johnson and Smith. Um, Hattie did some work on it as well, but everybody's come to very close to the same conclusion. When you take group work and you compare it to individualized instruction or direct instruction, students gain about a half of the year's worth of knowledge faster than they would any other way. So you're right. Direct instruction can work. Group work just does it better. When I talk to teachers about socializing or, or a social classroom, or I bring up the word social in a class, inevitably the first thing that comes up is, oh man, my kids are social, all right. They'll talk about whatever they want to talk about. But when I talk about social, that's not what I mean. When, when we talk about what social can be or what conversations should be in class, we should be talking about what or a phrase that I love to use, um, and I stole this one from Getting Smarter, and it's meaningful mathematical discourse. And as teachers, uh, I would screenshot this, I would take a picture of this, whatever you want to do, but this tells you what teachers do and students do to have that meaningful mathematical discourse so that kids are talking about what they should be talking about. Kids are growing and learning how they should be growing and learning in your math class, not talking about the dance last weekend or something they saw on TikTok or, or any of those things that the focus should be about how do we get mathematical knowledge in there, okay? Second uh, on this, when we talk about math, meaningful mathematical discourse, um, there are studies being done now that talk about the problems that we use in class. Okay. Um, I don't really get into that too deep, but I want to make sure that you guys know uh, something we're doing at Amplify is we're focused on solving real world problems. What we've discovered is when you talk about Janie buying six coats and then buying four more coats and then Maurice taking six of those coats away, students don't really connect very well to that one because who in the world has 10 coats when, when some of our kids are struggling to even find one? At Amplify, for instance, we look for meaningful, real-world problems to solve so that it becomes a, a great social learning experience and kids have a powerful way of talking to each other. The second piece of social, uh, and again, when we talk about what teachers can control, um, I like to unpack SEL, uh, or I like to talk about social-emotional learning or SEL, and I like to unpack it because what we're really talking about is the maturity in our students broken down into categories. That, that's what SEL is. I mean, look at the categories, right? We're talking about self-awareness, uh, responsible decision-making, social awareness, uh, and self-management and relationship skills. This is what everybody is, has always asked us for, is how are we teaching our students to be better people? And now, with our students going through remote and distance learning, that question comes up more than ever, right? If we understand what social emotional learning is and, and we start to build that in to our programs, we're gonna see a tremendous amount of success for students. We're gonna see a tremendous amount of growth in our students and, and how we do that as educators is we have to go out and get it. Um, so I wanna tell you one of my favorite places that I've, I've learned how to become a better educator through is the Friday Institute. Um, some of you might have school-wide programs like Leader and Me that might be putting SEL work into practice. But for those of you that don't, you want to go out and search those professional institutions that can help you develop in the realms that you want to develop in. Um, the Friday Institute has a lot of great courses, all for free, all through the North Carolina, uh, University of North Carolina or North Carolina Institute. Um, take a look at them. Oh, I think it's NC State. Sorry. Uh, I have North Carolina on my mind for other reasons. Okay, for my administrators in the, in the crowd, um, some of the numbers around SEL, I'm just gonna hit two of these. I'm gonna leave the middle one uh, off because I like the 11s um, because it's about a, it's 11 o'clock where I am out in Arizona. So when we look at the impact, um, for every dollar spent on an SEL program, uh, over the lifetime of that individual, their income, their total investment benefits um, outweighs it by 11 times. Okay, so we're talking about career choices. We're talking about uh, crime. We're talking about community contributions. We're talking about the lifetime of a person. And the 11% at the bottom, the last one that I, I wanted to hit, 
um, are for my academia folks that are out there. Um, inevitably, we start to say, oh, when we talk about the way kids feel and the way that the room operates and that social emotional learning and getting them to connect with teachers and each other, that doesn't, some people believe that that doesn't do a great job with an academic performance. And I couldn't disagree more. And the data agrees with me. So in other words, on average, students have an 11% gain in their academics uh, when they're using an established social emotional learning program. So no more C students, we're talking about A students. My premise with all of this is simple. If you build it, in other words, if you build a positive and engaging social emotional classroom that's structured for people to be successful, like structured for your students to be successful, they will be. Um, and kind of feel the dreams. Uh, I, have, I have some great Iowa friends, so I, I like to use this whenever I can. But the idea is prospering. We want students to have fun. We want them to enjoy learning. We want them to be here. So in that nature, uh, the last piece I wanted to talk about for the last five minutes we have are, let's talk about some digital tools that you might not know. Um, obviously, there's some great stuff out there. Your district probably has uh, Google uh, or Microsoft tools that you can use at the ready. Um, those are cloud tools now. They're tremendously fun to use and tremendously advantageous. It's fantastic to be a part of it, right? But here's a couple others that you might not have heard about, and I'm just going to run through them quickly. But again, I'll make this available for you after my presentation's over, and I'm hosting a VIP session on Thursday, uh, 9.15, 9.30 in the morning. If you want to come and join, happy to talk about all things social and collaborative, especially math. So here's tool number one. If you've never heard of Google Chase EDU, take a screenshot, uh, say, write yourself down a little note, go take it a look. But what it really is, is an online digital scavenger hunt. Um, Teachers create the scavenger hunt and they assign point values for what students need to discover. It's used to promote and challenge each other. It could be done individually or it could be done in groups, but give it a look. See if that's something that would reignite the energy in your classroom and definitely something that could be done virtually and in class, okay? One of the hardest ones to talk to people about that never have used it in classroom is Minecraft because a lot of us that have kids know Minecraft is just a game. Minecraft, the education edition, has evolved to far more than just a game. A game, And there are tons of lessons already pre-constructed for your students to use what they know as a game to understand mathematical concepts, right? The true gamification that my grandmother did with cards has gone digital and again, used in class or it's something that students could do at home or it's something that you know you could just practice and these are not things that you have to use all the time i'm not saying minecraft every day i'm saying pick and choose spots somewhere where it might be appropriate another one uh sorry dog started barking another digital tool that i started looking at was padlet but i think wall wisher and padlet is something we've always used a better version that for me and the uses that i have is something called mural.co uh, the reason I like Mural better, uh, I know there's an expense to it, um, but the reason I really like it better is because I can put my own images in the back. I can put uh, I can put brainstorming images. I can put uh, sequencing. I can put a lot of different things together so that kids grow and, and kids do it in the way that I want them. And of course, they can do it as a group. Desmos is phenomenal. If you, I always knew Desmos as an online graphing calculator, but it has evolved. It has evolved into much, much more than that. Um, I know we're running low on time, so I'm going to just encourage you, hey, take a deep dive into Desmos and really look at Desmos Teacher because it allows you to create lessons and it allows students to either be live or do, do this asynchronously when they need to learn and it allows you as a teacher to monitor their progress the entire way. Last, uh, this is a spin on the whole TikTok, YouTube, Instagram phenomenon. Um, and that is Flipgrid, another Microsoft, another Microsoft uh, invention in the education world. They've recently acquired Flipgrid, but what this does is it allows your students to have a video voice into their learning. Um, take a look at Flipgrid, see if it meets your needs as well. Last, I'm gonna leave you with this one. Um, Dr. Mann really let me know he cared by poking his head into that classroom for me, and he established a classroom where I could be successful. I wanna make sure that you, entering this year with that same energy, regardless of the conditions around us, regardless of what we can control and what we cannot, 
students will care about learning in your room once they know how much you care about them being in their room. So thank you all very much for the time today. Uh, thank you for the work that you do every single day. Again, there'll be a VIB session on Thursday. Um, find me on Twitter and I look forward to talking to you guys in the future. Have a great year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ben, thank you so much. We're looking forward to hearing you on Thursday. Thank you for sharing all that with us.